Okay, so here we have a, a pulley for a car engine and as a transducers we will use a one impact hammer and two accelerometers. All are connected to our certified analyzer. I'm going to describe you now the test object. Uh, this pulley has a rubber part in, inside uh, to, uh, to damp the torque ripple. So it's a good for EMA because we have a free free condition now. To the symmetrical shape, uh, we need to use multiple references, at least for radial direction. So one measurement here, why not one measurement here? And to have this displacement in vertical direction, we can add one more here. I'm going to show you the transducers. So one three actual accelerometers here, so we use two inputs, and one more actual accelerometer, so one input here. So in total, three references. So let's define how to hit the pulley with the hand impact hammer. So on uh, this cylinder, the bell cylinder, I will hit in one, two, three circles, eight location each, in radial direction. For the upper disc, I will have one, two, three circles, eight locations as well, for the vertical direction. Before starting acquisition of root points, we need to create a geometry in accordance with the pulley shape. It's possible to import CAD files such as IGES file, but here I will show you how it's easy to create a geometry from scratch. The pulley is roughly composed of one thin cylinder for the belt and one disc on the top. Let's first create a cylinder and then a disc. In other software, in the shapes library, let's select cylindrical shape with the same lens for both directions to get cylinder shape. And uh, maybe one segment, let's see what up has happened, and maybe add an additional segment to have three nodes on, on, on the shape. Rename it. Now the best cylinder is ready. For the upper disk, let's add an elliptical shape. Yes, we have to get a circle. Uh, we can rename it first. And then let's set the longest short axis to 10 to have the same diameter than the cylinder belt and fly over the mouse of illustration to get more information about properties. Now let's remove the nodes in the center since pulley is empty in this area. Just select and press delete through the keyboard. That's very intuitive. Okay, now there are two separate shapes. At the junction if you zoom in, there are repeating nodes, so let's use the features validity check to fix this. If we look at the node list, there is gap between index and node number, because we removed nodes previously. To fix any gap, let's use the renumber feature to get an order list. Now it's matched and geometry is ready. I'm going to talk to you about coordinate systems. In model software, coordinates are linked to each shape. I mean, cylindrical coordinates when shape is a cylinder, it makes sense. It's really convenient that coordinates are smartly linked because accelerometers measure response in the direction perpendicular to the surface. So when the local coordinate is linked to each node, Cartesian system is usually used. 
since directions do not match the measuring direction, trigonometric projections are needed. In model software, local coordinates are linked to the shape instead of each node. On this animation, it's clear that accelerometers, direction and measuring direction are matched. Now, geometry is ready and we can go uh, to the acquisition part. To start acquisition setup, let's select the transistors that will be used, impact armor and three accelerometers for as a reference, load from the database, here it is. Before going to the second settings, let's check that transducers are properly connected to the right analyzer input. Let's now configure the set sequence. Node 1 and 16 are reference node. X-axis for radial direction. Here we don't care about transducers, only DOF, degree of freedom. For the roving DOF, we will build up sequence in three steps. 24 nodes, X direction for the node for the belt cylinder. S yes, to batch add. We can rename it the belt cylinder. So the first step. The second step to build up the upper disk, 16 nodes, in vertical direction, Z axis. <clears throat> and at the end, we will add eight nodes that are common to the both shapes, the repeated nodes we got previously. Okay, so the number of set is one because of one armor for each set of measurements. Yeah, for the repeating node, we need to increment three by three. <coughs> we can rename it to complete this geometry. Okay, so now it's important to check if sequence is right. If directions are correct, it's easy first for all nodes. Yeah, we can see in the green vector as a roving DOF and the red vector as a reference fixed DOF. Accelerometers. Okay, so it looks nice and correct. Let's now see how to tune the metrology part. So, we need to analyze modes up to 5 kHz with a large number of lines to get a good damping estimation. We will hit three times and we don't need any wandering so far. For the trigger, let's select inputs and automatically the software will be found the channels for the hammer. Okay, let's hit on the threshold the pre-trigger and it's time to display and save the data we will need during acquisition all, uh, all channels on the same graph to, uh, to, ch to check any uh, double impact on the impact on the trigger block sorry and uh, all FRF in the same graph currents as well And now it's okay. So now uh, let's use the auto range features to uh, automatically uh, set the hammer threshold and in the same time uh, the range peaks. So click on auto range. Uh, two seconds is the time to go uh, to the to the parts. If my parts is far, it's convenient to, to make 
to use more time and four seconds is the time I have to hit after the beep on my structure to set properly the range peak and to avoid any overload so okay so now the range are up to date let's do the last check uh, to make sure that uh, the measurement uh, parameters are properly set um, in terms of i guess uh, i would check the current uh, the trigger block especially the lens if we need or not uh, windowing uh, so let's do our first uh, measurement so i press run i hit one point okay okay so um so the signal is properly damped so no no need to to use any windowing the current it looks very good and so uh for me it's okay now we are ready to start the test sequence so uh, before that so the geometry uh, gives me at any time so the, the nodes where I, I need to hit so it's a uh, so I focused on the green vector and it's also helpful to use the features like auto run to automatically switch to the next step uh, the double hit rejection uh, in case of uh, double impact and the overload rejection if I in case of uh, strong hit so let's start from the set one so I hit from net one so better two Four, only one hit to go fast. I previously checked the current. The current was good. So there is no way now that the current will be bad on this type of part. So node seven. Now I use Yes, so now it's hang because if I look at the trigger block, we clearly see a double impact. That's why uh, the hills get red, and I have to redo this hit at node 8. Okay, 9. So now I don't want to, uh, to to wait for the end of all my mesh, so I'm going to to check the consistency of my uh, data of from my nine points. So I send uh, the frequency domain data into my software in order to display the deflection shape of a part of my structure. I double click on the frequency domain section and I select, for example, the first resonance. So with a cursor here. And to check if there is no big error in terms of DOF. Okay, so it looks nice. So I can go ahead and complete the, the last point of my geometry okay so let's import the data containing 48 hits on the pulley so we can display all the rest together or each single set uh, so the data is uh, currently uh, importing 
and we would like to display the ODS uh, in the ODS section to refine the frequency domain and uh, we, we can um, soon display the MIF automatically the software will put the cursor on the maximum of the MIF so yes at this frequency so we can disable the deform shape and to switch to the lines before looking at uh, the dynamic uh, shapes let's check uh, the rigid body mode we can see that the upper disc is only moving and not the cylinder so we would like that the cylinder move in the same way than the, the edge on the disc so through this uh, excel sheet is very easy to copy past these equations to modal with right click and look now at the rigid body mode so okay so now always moving in vertical direction on the rigid body mode there is no error on the DOF okay so as the first mode here we have a two maxima shape and we have on the MIFs we have these three plots so if we would like to switch to the second one with this button and so on so it's a way to display the symmetrical um, modes in case of repeated volt this is uh, the three maxima shape and then the four maxima shape okay to complete maybe on a bit on the left there will be another mode at this stage okay this frequency so here we have a vertical direction mode as we can clearly see here Let's now identify the modes of this pulley through the narrowband method, which is the peak picking method. For identification, simply double click on the peak. Regardless if the modes are strongly coupled due to symmetry, the blue and red curves of the MIF are sometimes very close, so let's zoom in to determine the correct peak. Blue first, and then the red one. Let's now go ahead with the identification of the remaining modes. As you can see, there are at least six modes below 4000 Hz. Now let's identify those modes with the broadband method, which utilizes a broad frequency band. Low limits and high limits are set through cursors and a double click to validate. Then the stabilization chart will evaluate the stability of modal parameters versus polynomial orders. Select the Start Modal ID button to launch identification and see that symbols are displayed for each order. The Auto Selection feature will automatically select modes where the parameters are stable. Let's zoom in at the first modes to check that the two coupled modes have been selected. Hence, six modes will be estimated. After computation, the quality of modal parameter estimation can be evaluated through comparison between the actual measured FRF and resynthesized FRF. Here we have six modes identified by both methods. As you can see, frequency and damping values are listed. And deflection shapes are available through animation.
All points are moving synchronously because the real mode feature is on. Therefore, the unlinear part of the damping has been removed, leaving only the linear portion. This feature is useful to compare experimental and simulation data. To gain confidence in modal estimation, you should check curve fitting with both methods. Let's start with the narrowband method. For each mode, it is possible to refresh the curve fitting by adjusting the frequency range of interest, then double-clicking to update the local math model. In regards to the broadband method, you can browse any FRF to check the red curve fitting compared to the measured FRF. To validate a set of modes, let's compute the automac to check the orthogonality of modal vectors to one another. Perfect orthogonality means that all the elements of the main diagonal are 100% and all the other entries are zero. Here we see that all of the off-diagonal elements are very small, meaning that the vectors are almost orthogonal to each other, so the automac is very good. Now let's evaluate the correlation between the listed modes estimated by both methods. To do that, let's compute the cross-MAC between the broadband and narrowband results. Here is the cross-MAC matrix. The yellow bar is related to the z-axis, so we can ignore it. However, the fourth mode is radial and the MAC is weak. So let's take a look at the COMAC to figure out which nodes are contributing to the degradation of MAC for mode number 4. Let's select all modes except the fifth one and let's start computation of COMAC. Looking for values below 90%, we find nodes 20 and 21. So far in this video, we have checked that both methods provide reliable modal parameters. We noted a slight deviation for mode number 4. The COMAC indicates that node 20 and 21 are moving with a small deviation between broadband and narrowband results, so let's try to focus on this area to help us get the best parameters. First, let's arrange the animation of mode number 4 for each method for a better comparison. Mode number 4 is a 3 maximum shape, so we expect to see a symmetry axis here. This is clear in the narrow band animation. Now looking at the broadband animation, we can see the symmetry is not as obvious, which is because node 20 and 21 are no longer moving. In conclusion, we have determined in this example that it is best to use the narrowband method estimation.